In this video, I'm gonna be outlining five supplements that remain extremely popular despite a severe lack of scientific evidence for muscle growth or fat loss. Let's kick things off with testosterone boosters. This 2020 study did something really unique. They took the five most popular test boosters on amazon.com and analyzed the individual ingredients for effectiveness. These are the actual five products they investigated. Now, up front, it's worth mentioning that three of the five test boosters didn't even report how much of each ingredient was in the pills. They just gave a proprietary list. This is an immediate red flag because these products didn't even try to claim effective dosing. They could have added just a dusting to the bottle and it'd still meet the label claim. But even if most of these supplements did have honest label claims, most of their ingredients still aren't supported by scientific evidence. As you'd expect, the ingredients list includes the usual suspects, horny goat weed, boron, ashwagandha, fenugreek, etc. And of these, fully half had zero human studies showing a positive effect, nothing. Three ingredients had one or two studies showing a positive effect, but more research showing no effect. For example, saw palmetto and boron both have two positive studies, but then have six studies showing no effect at all. Fenugreek had four studies showing a positive effect, but also had three studies with indeterminate findings. So although fenugreek might be one to keep an eye on for future studies, the Examine Research database currently states that, quote, although there is limited evidence to support an increase in testosterone, more evidence than not denies such an increase. The ingredient that looked most promising to me was ashwagandha. And even though this paper cited just one study showing a positive effect, I am aware of a few more that also showed an increase. And I personally take 600 milligrams of ashwagandha per day. That's more because of its impact on cortisol, stress, and other possible health benefits. But if it turns out to also boost testosterone, I'll take that as a bonus. Of course, there's a bit of an issue with just doing a simple tally of the number of studies for and against a certain supplement, as some studies are higher quality than others. But I think this is still good enough for giving you a general lay of the land. And regardless, when you do dig into the individual studies, you'll see that even the best compounds in the best studies are still pretty underwhelming. It's important to realize that when people inject testosterone, their test levels increase by massive amounts. The study showed that when subjects injected 600 milligrams of testosterone and anthate, an anabolic steroid, their test levels went from 630 all the way up to 2,370 nanograms per deciliter, a 1,740 increase. By comparison, the natural test booster I'm most optimistic about, ashwagandha, only increased testosterone by 96 nanograms per deciliter. So pretty underwhelming by comparison to actual steroids, but still could be worth considering, especially if you have low testosterone and wanna avoid the side effects associated with steroid use. But even with that said, there are still other better methods for boosting testosterone than dietary supplements. These include getting seven to eight hours of sleep at night, maintaining a healthy body weight, ensuring that there's enough overall fat in your diet, and increasing micronutrients that you could be deficient in. For example, you might not be getting enough zinc, magnesium, or vitamin D. So these are the things I'd focus on. And to borrow a line from a recent issue of the Mass Research Review, if you have fairly normal or even high testosterone levels, none of the supplements currently marketed as testosterone boosters are likely to yield meaningful benefits. Of course, despite this, in the Amazon study, average reviews for the test boosters were still very positive. The top five supplements had an average rating of 4.5 out of five stars. This proves that just because a product has positive reviews doesn't mean it actually works. What we're most likely seeing here is the power of placebo. When people spend money on a new supplement, they almost always do other things, like start trading harder or eating a better diet, which is great, but then they falsely attribute any results they get to the new pills. And this is something we'll see at play once again in the second supplement on my list. So number two on my list to avoid is terkestrone. Now, six months ago, I did a video breaking down what terkestrone is and why it isn't deserving of the marketing hype it's gotten over the last year or two. In fact, at the time of publishing that video, there was zero human evidence on terkestrone and there's still zero human evidence on terkestrone today. But a lot else has happened in the terkestrone world since publishing that video, so I figured I'd quickly get everyone up to speed. Now, if you remember, while there wasn't any human data on terkestrone specifically, there is some research on related ectosteroids, the most promising of which was this 2019 study from Eisenman and colleagues, which did, in fact, show that subjects taking a peak ectosone supplement saw significantly greater muscle gains than a group taking placebo. But there was a catch. When they lab tested the peak ectosome pills, they found that they only contained 6% of what was claimed on the label. Instead of 100 milligrams of ectosterone, it had six milligrams of ectosterone. This strongly implied that there's some serious quality control issues with these supplements, but it gets worse because last month, a company called Nootropics Depot ran some independent lab tests on the most popular terkestrone supplements on the market. 
They found that while Greg Doucette's Turk Builder claimed to contain 500 milligrams of terkestrone per capsule, it only actually contained 0.7 milligrams per capsule. Just 0.15% of what was advertised on the label was actually in the bottle. The Gorilla Mine Turkestrone pills also had less than 1% of the label claim, and some other Turkestrone products had no detectable Turkestrone at all. Now, a few people have been quick to write off these lab results since Nootropics Depot also sells supplements, so they could have a vested interest in making these other products look bad. However, there's been a lot of back and forth between these parties, and it's all available online. And as someone who personally has a degree in biochemistry, I do find the chemistry from the Nootropics lab convincing. Granted, I'm not exactly a Turkestrone fan, so I could have some bias as well, but you can go through it all for yourself, and I'll link all the lab tests and the relevant replies down below. And to be fair, I know there are still some question marks in terms of exactly how to detect and tease apart these different ectosteroids, as many of them are chemically similar. It's kind of like iffy stratifying for this ectosteroid because there's so many similar molecules and stuff that it seems like there's a lot of chemistry debate as to even figuring out if it's there, if it's cross detecting as something else, what is going on. But as I see it, this whole situation should be a huge red flag because not only do these products have a sketchy science base to begin with, they also have serious quality control issues. And this is why I think it's so important to be a so-called late adopter in an industry that's this poorly regulated. In the words of Dr. Eric Helms, even the most effective supplements like creatine and caffeine still make a very small impact. So don't get caught up by the hype surrounding a new supplement. You won't miss out if you simply wait a year or two until additional studies are published. Now I'm going off script just a little bit here, but I did want to say that I do understand the impulse to want to try the new flashy thing. When I was new to lifting, I'd see an ad in some bodybuilding magazine and immediately want to try that product. And oftentimes I would actually buy that product and I'd try it and get results. But over the years, I learned that it was actually me who was getting those results. It was my hard work in the gym and my dedication to the diet that was building muscle, not some flashy pill. Okay, so number three on my list is BCAAs. Now, just so everyone's on the same page, BCAA stands for branched chain amino acid. Amino acids, of course, make up the protein and the foods that we eat, and there are 20 amino acids that make a complete protein. Nine of those 20 are essential, meaning you need to get them in your diet because your body can't make them on its own. And three of those have this branched chain chemical structure, and those are the BCAAs, leucine, isoleucine, and valine. Leucine is the crucial amino acid for triggering muscle protein synthesis, and you can think of it like the key to starting your car. The other two, isoleucine and valine, don't trigger muscle protein synthesis, but they're still often included because if you take leucine on its own, it decreases the concentration of isoleucine and valine in the blood, which is bad because you need isoleucine and valine to build new muscle tissue. Of course, none of this really matters because not only do you need isoleucine and valine to build muscle, you need all nine essential amino acids. So taking leucine without all the other essential amino acids would be like turning the key to your car without any gas in it. So while BCAAs are extremely important, in fact, required to build muscle, they're still more or less useless if you're consuming them in the absence of the other essential amino acids. And research repeatedly shows this. The latest systematic review from January of this year, which analyzed 12 studies, found no benefit of BCAA supplementation on performance, strength, or muscle mass. So instead of amino acid supplements, I simply focus on getting enough total protein. Now, there may be a few exceptions where I'd consider supplementing EAAs, such as if you're eating a vegetarian meal that's low in protein quality and you'd like to boost its amino acid profile. But in that case, you could just have a vegan protein shake instead. Or if you're very lean and you're the end of a diet and you'd like to have some extra so-called anabolic insurance during your workout, sipping on some EAAs might not hurt, especially if you train fasted. But overall, BCAAs aren't a product I'd recommend and I'd focus on simply eating enough protein instead. And I'll link my video detailing exactly how much protein you need for muscle growth down below. Number four on my list is fat burners. And while fat burners have gotten somewhat of a bad rap in the online fitness space these days, they're still extremely popular in the broader public. So generally speaking, fat burners claim to work through one of two pathways. They either lower appetite, meaning you might eat less, so less calories in, or they increase energy expenditure through a so-called thermogenic effect, so more calories out. 
Now, on paper, both of these mechanisms should work. It's just that in reality, not much seems to happen. If we look at the most recent meta-analysis on fat burners and thermogenic supplements, we can see that overall, there was no indication that the inclusion of fat burners and thermogenic dietary supplements was any more effective than exercise or a combination of diet and exercise. And while it is true that caffeine and green tea extract can have some benefit in terms of energy expenditure, it's so small in comparison to diet and exercise that we have to question the practical relevance. But I think caffeine is a good supplement to take before training anyway, not because it's such a great fat burner, but because it reliably boosts training performance. And if you get a few extra calories burned from taking it, then great. But when caffeine is repackaged with other ineffective or unsubstantiated herbs and compounds, and then marketed as some kind of special fat burner, that's when I start to raise an eyebrow and recommend against buying them. And the last supplement on my list is beta alanine. So in this case, it isn't that beta alanine doesn't work, it almost certainly does, just not for typical resistance training. Beta alanine works by lowering the level of acidity in the muscle, which helps the muscle keep pushing for a bit longer. That sounds like a very good thing, but the problem is that increased acidity likely isn't causing fatigue for sets that last less than 30 seconds or so. It takes time for lactic acid to build up, and a typical muscle building set in the range of, say, eight to 12 reps, doesn't last long enough for beta alanine to have an effect. In fact, this 2012 meta-analysis found that beta alanine was only effective for exercise lasting one to four minutes and didn't do anything for exercise lasting less than 60 seconds. So sets under 20 to 30 reps or so most likely won't yield any benefit from beta alanine supplementation. That said, I do think beta alanine is great for endurance training and it could be beneficial for people who do a lot of really high rep sets or even circuit style workouts that have both a resistance component and a cardio component. But for people simply looking to build muscle, most training should be in the six to 15 rep range or so anyway. And in that rep range, beta alanine doesn't seem to work. And that's it for this one, guys. If you're looking for a complete guide to your nutrition, including the supplements that I do recommend, you can check out my ultimate guide to body recomposition on my website, jeffnipper.com. It's over 250 pages of information on calories, protein, cardio, supplements, sleep, sample meal plans, and really everything you need to know. So I'll leave a link to that down below. Don't forget to leave me a thumbs up if you enjoyed the video, subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you guys all here in the next one.